Good afternoon. I hope everybody's doing well today. Love you guys. Hi, Carolyn. Good to see you here. Oh, I've got an itchy nose. Hopefully I won't start sneezing. Hey, sweet Linda, I am much better. God is so good. Oh, we had a long weekend and it was exhausting, but I'm doing well. Hey, sweet Stacy. Love you. So good to see y'all. Linda, how are you doing? Are you feeling better? Is that dizziness about gone now? I love y'all. It's so good to see you. I'm going to go ahead and get started pretty quick. I know folks will be popping on and um, some more greetings to be had, but I, I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm praying, girl. Dizziness. Dizziness can cause nausea and everything else, so I'm praying. Amen. Hey, Elizabeth, it was good to see you on Saturday. I hope I'm not being slurpy when I drink my coffee. It's hot. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this week's Bible study, I didn't even realize it at the time. Hello, Gloria. Thank you. Um, pray for Aaron. Aaron has caught that head cold thing, and so has Olivia. So pray for them. Um. You know, this junk is just going around. I was talking to um, our friend John up in New York State, and he said that the stomach virus, thankfully we haven't gotten the stomach virus, but there's a stomach virus up there too. So it's just going around, and everybody just needs prayer, don't we all? Um, anyway, to this Bible study um, is going to kind of bump along the heels of last week's. Hi, Brigitte. And, and so you're going to hear some similarities, but I'm coming at this with a different viewpoint because there was a couple of things that you ladies mentioned last week, hey Suzanne, that really spurred me to do a little bit more study. I also got a message today from a dear sister, and, and I won't share who it was, but just a, a, one of our sisters in the Lord sharing with me some concerns. And as I was sharing my response, the Lord reminded me of when the kids were little and they would be stressing over something. And I would say, you're thinking too much. You're thinking too much. You're overanalyzing the situation. Some things you just have to take by faith. And that was the response part of the response the Lord gave me for this sister. And I want to encourage y'all this week as we go through, be careful about what your mind processes. Let your spirit process the word of God because the mind can confuse things with its education. Our emotions can taint things because they're emotions. And uh, we have to receive the truth from the word by the Holy Spirit of God. That's He quickens the word to us. So that is just a an absolute spiritual truth. You have to receive it by the Spirit. So as we go through today, um, the Bible study, just remember that. Don't overthink in your in your human brain. Think in your spirit because that's where the Lord can heal and he can work miracles through the spirit. Do y'all agree? And um, remember, y'all be commenting because you know I like the commenting. We get so much out of all the viewpoints. I love it. What we're going to look at today is, I titled it, A Pillar of Salt. So, you already know where I'm going. But, um, you know, I talked last week about, about things of this world creeping into our lives and things that we tolerate in this world. And, and I, you know, Haley actually 
called me this morning. She said, Mama, I'm, I'm re-listening to these messages. And she said, it's just, you know, I, I'm getting so much out of last week's or the week before. And I said, well, that's wonderful. And, you know, it really does all kind of, of link together because it's all the truth of the Word of God. And, and I'm focusing our Bible studies, my Bible study, for things that will help me as a woman. Um, I'm not a man. I'm not the head of a church or the head of a home or, or I, you know, I'm not in the leadership position. I have a husband over me. And, and if you don't have a husband, hopefully you have a pastor or some other um, man in your life that can help be that head um, over you to, to help you as a woman to stay grounded, to stay where you need to be in the spirit. And I don't say that lightly because we are we are a weaker vessel. Hey, my baby girl, I hope you're feeling better, Erin. I hope that hand and chest mm -hmm. is better. Um. Anyway, so today we're going to look at Lot's wife, and we're going to get into that in detail. Hey, hey, Lee. And we're just going to really concentrate on looking at this from a woman's point of view. Okay, we read these Bible study stories because, you know, there's these great men of God. But remember, there's women standing behind them, too. And that's that's where we've got a reference. Right. But we're going to start in Luke, Luke 17. 26 through 33. Let me say this before I read that. When I talk about looking back, I'm not talking about nostalgia. I'm not talking about memories, sweet memories from our past. Hello, Ann. Good to have you with us. I'm not talking about, um, you know, even learning from the past. You know, uh, learning from people of the past. Those are all wonderful things, and I don't think there's a thing ungodly about looking at the past in that reference. Just clarifying that. Um Nostalgia is a sweet thing I think the Lord gave us to look back with sweet memories about things. Looking back at your family history, you know, all of those things, they're not negative unless you be, let them become an idol in your life. But we're going to start in Luke chapter 17, verse 26 through 33. And it, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Noah, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Thus, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. <coughs> Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Now, that is the beginning of our Bible study. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. As I was studying through all of this, the Lord prompted me, and I talked about this a little bit last week, about how we all have to function in this world. As women, you get up, you make the bed, you wash your face, you brush your teeth, you make breakfast, you, you know, you clean up the house, you take care of the kids, you have chores and activities that we do. Maybe you work, a, 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 you know, I know Suzanne works part-time job. Hey, Yoshana, um, if you've got little babies, you're Wiping bottoms and wiping noses and cleaning up mess and going to the park. You know, we all have tasks 
that we do in this life. And sometimes it is hard when you have this continuous um, routine of just daily activity. I, you know, they used to call it drudgery. But to me, it's not drudgery. It's my blessing, my blessing of work. So you have this that you do all day long, and the, and we tend to compartmentalize what we do. You know, this is taking care of the kids. This is taking care of my husband. This is taking care of, you know, ministering to the community. This is my Bible study time. We compartmentalize all of this stuff. But when that trumpet sounds, we're not going to worry if, we finish folding the laundry, right? We're not going to allow the things of, that's right, you got to keep moving. Um, it's it's not going to be in our forethought because there's going to be one thing. As, as a born-again child of God, when that trumpet sounds, we're, we're looking up, we're going up. That's the way it is. And I remember um, my stepfather telling me one time, he said, well, you know, when the Lord comes, you don't get to go. What a thing to say to a young mother. But it made me infuriated. And I thought, what? But you know, the more I've matured and the more I've thought about it, I understand the point of what he was saying. If anything of this world takes precedence over Father God, Jesus Christ. We need to change our focus. And that's a hard thing to deal with, especially when you're a mother and have children. We're going to talk about that today. Okay? We're going to just look at that. And, and you know, all of us have our own viewpoint. But I just want us to really, like I tell the kids, put on your thinking hat. Get ready. Focus on Christ. And we look at this scripture. In verse 31, In that day he which shall be upon the house to, housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. He's saying, don't worry about your stuff. Don't worry about everything else. You focus on what's happening. In that day, as in the days of Noah, everybody was going about doing their own thing. And then they felt a raindrop. They felt a raindrop. Somebody looked up. Got a raindrop right there. They had no clue what was coming, even though it had been preached to them by Noah. They had no clue what was really coming. In the days of Lot, they were walking around doing their business, having their activities, eating breakfast, eating lunch, had no idea what was coming. But no one knew what was coming. Lot actually received a warning because the angels came. I want us to really think about day-to-day -day activity when you absolutely are so involved in what you're doing at the moment that you lose track of being ready. And you know, I've shared with y'all before when I, when I did the Bible study about prayer, pray without ceasing, and people say, well, that's not possible. How can you pray without ceasing? Well, you can pray without ceasing. It is an attitude that you stay in all the time. And within a split nanosecond, suddenly you realize you're already praying before your brain registered that you're praying. Your spirit was praying, right? So, it's vitally important that we all step out of that mindset that we've got all this stuff to do and we'll deal with this over here later, meaning the things of God. And I know you ladies, as I see your names popping up, 
I know that y'all are committed to the Lord, but even the most committed of us at times allow ourselves to be consumed with the day's activities. Am I right? I know I do. I know I do. Genesis chapter 19. Now we're going to go through Genesis 19 and read this story. And I'm not trying to teach you this story as a lesson. I'm not trying to teach this to you. I'm just going to share with you what the Lord showed me. And I've heard countless messages about this. My husband's taught in our home church many times about Lot and all that happened. But I'll I want you, as we go through this, and this is what the Lord did to me, or did for me, he said, I want you to shift your thinking from looking at what is happening with Lot to what's happening with his wife. Okay, so so let's refocus and think about being Lot's wife as this whole process is going on. I want to show you some things that the Lord showed me, and, and you're probably going to see things that I haven't even seen, So so like I said, Comments are welcome. Verse number one, Genesis 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. First point. Verse one. If Lot is sitting at the gate, that means he's part of the leadership. That was a designation that he was part of the leadership. That means, just obviously, if he's part of the leadership, then his wife has an elevated status in the community. She's not just a little lady who lives down the street and you just see her hanging her clothes out on the line every now and then. She's part of the leadership of the community. She's the one who's throwing the tea parties and, you know, fixing supper for the dignitaries. She's part of this leadership group. Verse 2, And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your way. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Verse 3, And he pressed upon them greatly. This made him concerned. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Second thing, he knew his community. He pressed them to come in unto his house. You can already see this does not take um, this does not take uh, uh, college degrees to figure this out. Hi, Kelly, bless your sweetheart. He knew what was going on out in those streets, and he didn't want these men out there. Come inside. Please, come inside. Come inside. Come inside. So here is his wife in the home. I guarantee you there was a little bit of side conversation with eyes looking back and forth between Lot and her. And she, you know, he, it says he made them a feast. I'm sure she was part of cooking that meal, thinking about what was happening. Verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both young, old and young, all the people from every quarter. There was this mass onslaught coming to their house. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Now we all know what this is about. And I'm not going to spend time discussing it. It's a horrible thought. But And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. He closed the door behind himself and stood out there. Now the next, the next verse got me. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. He called them brethren. Whatever the men of the city's plan was, we know it was wicked. This was not Lot's brethren. 
but he had come to feel such a connection with them. Again, as part of the leadership, what do we accept? What do we accept into our homes, into our families, into our communities that God calls wicked? I'm not talking about just this, this situation. I'm talking about a, a pantheon, good word, a pantheon of other things. You know, there we think of sins by degree, don't we? We have the biggies, murder, you know, assault, all this stuff. And then there's the others that we don't think of as the biggies. But you know what? They're probably even bigger. Pride. Gossip. Slandering. Uh, laziness. I consider laziness a sin. Don't y'all? There's these things that we, we group sins by degree. That's not scriptural. But... When you tolerate things little bit by little bit, what what we want to call little sins become much bigger. And you know, the book of James talks about that. It begins with a thought. And when you entertain that thought, it becomes sin. And, and ultimately, sin is acted upon, right? So, verse 8. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. They're virgins. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. That one scripture has boggled my mind all of my life. How could a man offer his two daughters to a raging crowd bent on destroying someone? That's, that's one of those things I have to trust God about. And I'll ask him when I get up there. Of course, we ultimately see that uh, Lot was not quite squared away with God, was he? But he offered his two daughters, his two virgin daughters, and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon him even Lot and came near to break the door. They were coming to attack Lot now. And they said, Angie Southern paraphrase, who is this guy? He showed up in our town and now he's trying to tell us what to do. We are not of this world. And this world will never accept a child of God. If they fully accept, then that child of God is compromising. <gasps> Did she just say that? <laughs> Did I just see a mushroom cloud go up somewhere? I'm sorry, ladies. If you are friends with the world, it's not scriptural. We're called to be ministers. We are called to love, but friendship with the world is enmity with God. You can't have it both ways. You cannot have it both ways. And I, I understand that Jesus sat and, and ate with the, the publicans and the harlots and all of this stuff. But as I talked about several weeks ago, that doesn't mean he was their buddy. That doesn't mean that he was their friend like we think of a friend. He was there for a purpose, a purpose to minister and bring them up out of the wickedness that they were living in. So just because he sat there and ate a meal with those who were walking in ungodliness doesn't mean he was encouraging or supporting their behavior. Remember, we're talking about looking back. 
verse 10, but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were wearied. They wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place. Because of the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Now, I've done a lot of study on that, because there's two ways to look at that. Either these sons-in-laws were betrothed to these virgin daughters that still lived in Lot's home, or these were actual sons-in-law and Lot had additional daughters. Both viewpoints are possible. Even the early church in the teachings of Josephus and all, it is possible either way. There's no evidence one way or another. So it is possible that Lot had more daughters that ultimately were destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. Either way, the sons-in-law definitely did not come out. Verse 15, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, meaning in the house, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, now, now catch hold of that. He lingered. He didn't jump up, grab his wife and daughters, and get out of there. He was dawdling. Ask yourself the question. Why would he be dawdling? Why would he be lingering? The men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. The, the angels literally grabbed them all by the hand and started pulling them out of the city because they were lingering. God forbid that I should linger in the midst of sin that he is trying to pull me out of. God forbid that I should cleave a little bit longer to something, even though the Lord has made it abundantly clear that it is not good. It is evil in his sight. Why do we do that? Why do we, why do we hold on just a little bit more? Because we really like it, because it's fun, because it's not really hurting anybody. But, you know, I love these folks, and, and yeah, I know they're not doing right, but they're so much fun. Verse 17. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. They're saying, don't turn around and look back. Don't even stay in the remote area. Don't even hang around on the outer edge of it. Get away, completely away. This goes back to last week when I was talking about dusting, dusting off their sandals, getting it, getting every aspect of the ungodly out completely. We, we can't even like tolerate a little bit. Why would God tell them that? Why? And that this is Old Testament. We, sh I showed you things in the New Testament that he showed me. We can't tolerate any ungodliness in our life. It does not mean that we cannot love those who have not come into the kingdom. 
We must love them and we must work to bring them into the kingdom where they can leave sin behind. And Lot said unto them, now this is verse 18, y'all. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. We need organ music right there. Dun, 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 dun. Not so, my Lord. What? What? Does anybody have the audacity to say, No, God. No. Father, forgive me. I have said it before in my life. And I hope and pray I never say it again. Have y'all ever said no? I'm, I'm just, I don't see that. I'm just not going to do that. I understand that the Bible says that, but that can't be the right interpretation. I need to get a new translation of the Bible. And then you find a new translation and you like how it says it better. Not so, my Lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and die. Think about that. We are surrounded by it. How do you find the balance when... They seek you out because they like hanging out with you. How much time do you guide people to be born again? You know, Suzanne, that's an excellent point. And I believe when you are submitted to the Holy Spirit of God and you are praying over that situation that he will show you. He will show you that point. We have an extended family member who has chosen a very ungodly lifestyle and, and that person walks in it with great joy. Of course, and has no intention of repenting, has no intention, even though the truth has been revealed time and again. And I, and I have to say, I've never been a big part of that. But I know that the people around that person have, have exhausted themselves continually for decades to try to help bring that person to the understanding that they're, they're in wickedness. And, you know, a dear friend of mine told me one time she has three children and, and, we were talking one day about her eldest child and, and he ended up in prison for things he was doing. And, and you know, I was talking to her and, and trying to comfort her. And, you know, she had um, raised him in, in the, ad, yes, decades, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And he had rejected, absolutely outright rejected the things of God for the things of this world and as we were talking about now you know we had some prodigal children and and i was saying you know i just you know how, how are you dealing with this and she said actually i have peace now because she said i finally got that revelation that some will not choose christ and she said and i born guilt for so many years because I could not get through to him. What was what, baby? Did you hear a big thing? That was my news notifications. I can't get it to stop. But she told me, she said, I, I rec recognize now that my job is to love him, but I cannot be with him. And the reason was because of him bringing that into the rest of the family and influencing the children in the family. And she said, I just, I just could not get peace about it. And then the Holy Spirit revealed that to me. We can't make somebody be born again. It's not possible. I know, Kelly, bless your heart. We sure have been praying for you and for, and for her. 
But you can't make somebody be born again. But to bend and stretch and compromise the word of God so that they don't feel bad or so that you can be. I know this is hard, y'all. I, I know it is. Believe me, I'm living it in on some levels. But but all of the hurt and the pain and the sorrow that we feel can't it doesn't change the word of God. We can't do the oh not so my lord because the the compromise that we see in this household that we're reading about ended up producing two children that ended up the greatest enemies of Israel. Now think about that for a minute. Moab and Ammon were the children. Yes, it is. It is hard. Amen. Amen. Good, Ann. Let me finish reading these scriptures before I go on. Now that one, verse 19, where he said, Not so, Lord, lest some evil betake me. Uh, evil take me and I die. God had just delivered him out of Sodom and Gomorrah and fire and brimstone raining down to destroy and he thinks God's not big enough to take care of him out in the wilderness. I mean, can you see the lack of faith here? The lack of faith. And you know, we don't really ever have to be harsh. We don't ever have to um, be ugly and, and just, and you know, even the script, it's, he doesn't tell us to um, just turn our backs, but letting that person into your holy of holies, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying there? There's such a difference in the two. You can. You can still minister smiling, loving, and hugging to people, but not allow them into your holy of holies. You know, not to make that that bond with them. We're, we are not to bond, but to draw them in with love is a different thing than, than bonding with them. Now, if a born, supposedly born-again Christian is walking in sin, it's clear what we're supposed to do there in Matthew. You know, that's another Bible study, and I think I actually covered it a while back. We sh a Christian should never be hateful or harsh or rude or snotty to somebody, but there does come a time when you've got to limit fellowship with those who are flaunting ungodliness and, and even flaunting it in your face as a mockery of God. Now, how you respond to that is what you can control. But God gives us plenty of clear views of how he wants us to deal with the world. and just But not being unequally yoked. And you know, unequally yoked can be a lot more than just marriage. A lot of folks want to assign that to marriage. It can be a lot of things. Any kind of um, commitment or agreement that's one reason that I boycott certain stores because they they openly, happily give money to very wicked things. So if I give them my money, then they are going to give my money to somebody to help support and encourage wickedness. And, and you know, I get mocked for that all the time. Well, I'm sorry. People may not understand it, but you know what? I answer to God. I don't answer to other people. And, and listen, I'm not going to be caught saying, not so, my Lord. I'm not going to be caught in that. Bless your heart, Kelly. I know God is strengthening y'all and giving you wisdom. Let me move on. So he's, he's afraid that God can't take care of him out here in the wilderness. <laughs> Somebody's calling my cell phone. Verse 20. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. 
Is it not a little one? And my soul shall be saved. Let me go to the, the place you don't want me to go. Just because it's, it's little. It's not a big one. It's a little place. Let me just be there. Because I'll be more comfortable there. I know you're not going to be able to take care of me out in the wilderness. But just let me go to this little bitty city and have just a little bit of my own flesh, please. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till they, thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. And he, he told him, he said, well, come on, because I can't do anything till you get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> yes, that's my paraphrase. I've got a tickle in my throat today. <coughs> Verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. <coughs> and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Remember when Lot said, no, Lord, I don't, I, Lord, you don't understand my situation. Have you ever thought that, Lord? Let me explain to you what's happening. <clears throat> now, I will tell you, Lot didn't stay in Zoar because he was afraid there, too. A spirit of fear had locked into him. Verse 26, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. We all know that. We've heard that since we were little kids and the little pillar of salt in the in the picture. But she looked back because that's what made sense to her. The life back there made sense. She understood that life and that's where her heart was. Possibly a couple of her children, at the very least two sons-in-law, her friends, her furniture, her jewelry maybe, all of her stuff, her house, all were back there. That's where she felt comfortable. And she had to look back again. No, Lord. We have got to focus on the things of God and not look back again. Not look back to where we were the most comfortable. Not look back to where we were having the most fun. Not look back to, to the party time. And you know, as the road gets more narrow, fewer people want to join in. And that grieves me. People that I have loved through the years that I now see, you know, mamas that I homeschooled with all those years, and I, I pull up their, their Facebook pages and I see their children absolutely turned completely away from the things of God, and it breaks my heart. Because you see compromise, more and more compromise, and you realize you were watching the seeds of that years ago. And when that seed is left alone, if it's got good soil to work in, you know, there can be good soil for God and there can be good soil for the devil. And when it's given its time and it's watered and it's cared for and it's protected and excuses are made to leave it alone and let it do its thing, that stuff grows. You can grow this beautiful olive tree for the Lord and you can grow this horrible briar that takes over everything. Kudzu in the south. It just takes over everything. We cannot compromise the things of God. I know it's hard, ladies. When she looked back, look that phrase for looked back, regard, pay attention to, consider. It wasn't a fleeting thing. It wasn't a, oh, there's a loud boom. And you just out of reflex look back. She looked back to consider. She looked back to think about. 
her focus was there. You know, I've thought about that. I, I've really meditated on that. I thought, you know, if I heard explosions and 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 smelled smoke, I just just my my bodily reflex would be to glance back over my shoulder. That's not what she did. She looked back and considered. That's the difference. It's not just a little reflex, a little a little accident. It's a thought out process to say, I'm tired of this. I don't want to do this anymore. I like what's going on over there. Colossians 3, 2. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Philippians 3.13 Brethren, I count my, not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I know it's hard. It's hard for me. I'm not talking to y'all in any way that I'm not talking to myself. Luke 9, 59 through 62. And he, now this one, you know, sometimes it sounds kind of heartless. Jesus was talking. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. In some ways, we can look at that and say, that, that's just heartless. Let me go bury my father. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. It's not heartless. There is a divine concept here that we as human, especially human women, don't grasp easily. He's not saying, you can never see your family again. Your daddy just died. You can't go to the funeral. That's not what they were asking for. Their focus was not. You have to really think about who Jesus was and who he is and what he's calling us to do. Even so, if God had a calling on our life and he said, I want you to go now, this minute, and do this, and yet... You had a pile of dishes in the sink. Well, Lord, let me finish my dishes first. No, I want you to stop right now. I want you to pick up that phone. I want you to call so-and-so. And I want you to tell them that you love them and you're praying for them. But, Lord, i got to get these dishes done. No, you don't. Let's put this in perspective of, of us women. Nothing is more important than doing what God is telling you to do. But God is not going to tell us to do something that is mean, hateful, evil, unholy, selfish, arrogant, rude. He's not going to call you to do something like that. That's not how God works. So if he's giving you some unction by his spirit and you're hesitant because you think it's going to look bad or look mean or look prideful, you guarantee in your spirit that you're following the word of God, following his will, and do it. Just do it. it I learned this a long time ago. My efforts in somebody's life, if I'm not called of God to be the laborer in that person's life, I may be hindering the laborer that he has called to be in their life to bring them revelation. 
that's something that goes above my pay grade. I don't understand it. I understand that it works, and I understand that God knows what he's doing, but sometimes it does not make sense to me. Sometimes I have to step out of the way so that God can bring the person in that that person needs. Sometimes I'm, I'm functioning with a, a tainted viewpoint. Maybe I've got emotions that aren't, don't need to be involved. Maybe I don't have, um, I hate to say the experience because God can use anybody to minister. But, you know, maybe there's a better fit for a minister to be in a person's life than I am. Are y'all grasping what I'm saying? Yes, she did. Yes, she did. She got the she got the consequences. Isaiah 43:18 and 19. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, and ye shall not know it. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, ye shall, or shall ye not know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. What does that tell us? He's doing a new thing. He doesn't want us to think about the old stuff, the old way. I'm not talking about nostalgia. I'm talking about the old us, the old life, the old sin, the old, old way we did things. And he's telling us clearly, you're going to go through a wilderness. You're going to go through rivers. You're going to go through a desert. He's already telling us that it's not going to be easy to do things he wants us to do. It's going to get hard. Those are places of scary things those are places where crises can occur dry places places where you might feel like you're going to drown places where you can't find where to put the next step but he will make a way second peter 2 20 through 22 for if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled again and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog returned to his vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. We cannot be that way. We cannot return to the evil. Not the big stuff. Ladies, I don't think there's a murderer amongst us that actually committed a physical murder. But have you ever been so mad at somebody that you hated them? That you just hated their guts? Goodbye, Ann. I'm glad you were able to join us. But that's, you know, the Bible says that's murder. Have you ever lusted after somebody? We don't want to be entangled again. We don't want to be locked up into this mode of sin that we don't even realize is happening. He wants to do a new thing, but we got to quit looking backwards. At the stuff we're missing. Oh, I miss that. Don't you miss that? I miss that. James chapter 1, 23 through 25. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Continuing in the leading of where you're heading. Don't stall. Don't let your...
your engine stall as you keep backing up two steps. Second Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's my last scripture for today. And I tell you what, I prayed about this Bible study for a long time because it's hard. It's hard to think we might be moving in the direction of Lot's wife sometimes. We have grace now. We have the new covenant because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But our human nature... That's why we have to die to self all the time because that human nature is the same human nature that Lot's wife started out with. It's all the same human nature, flesh, that wants what we want. We want to be pleased and sin is pleasurable for a season, but then destruction comes. I guarantee you five steps before she turned around, she thought she was going to be okay. Two steps before that neck turned her head, she thought she was going to be okay. But that little thing was plaguing her heart, plaguing her mind, and she just couldn't control it anymore. She had let it go so long. Instead of acting in faith and looking toward her husband's faith, even though he still was functioning in fear. That's a message for the husbands. Ladies, two steps before, she didn't know she was just about too far. It is a daily struggle. And in our society, it's even harder, I think. Because so much is thrown up in our face every day. And, and there's so much compromise in the church. So much compromise. It's, it's mind-boggling. But his, his revelation is still enough. It's, his Holy Spirit is still strong enough to keep us from wishing for what we had back then. That wasn't really that good anyway, right? Temporary pleasure, temporary fun. Olivia and I were talking about that this morning, you know, that that when we think, okay, we've got this conquered, and then we slip just a little bit, and, you know, just for a second, oh, how fun, and then... <sighs> Don't look back. Don't compromise anything, not even a little bit. If you let that one peppermint plant start out of your soil and you don't snip that thing off right then and dig the whole area around it, that thing will cover your garden. And you will be fighting day after day to get good things out of it. This is for me. Maybe none of you guys have experienced this or, or feel any, any connection to this Bible study. But I know what the Holy Spirit is telling me. Angie, you cannot slip backwards. You cannot compromise the Word of God. You cannot, you cannot. And there cannot be any no, Lord, you don't understand. No, Lord, this is what I think about it, and I think this is the best thing. It can't be any of that. I love you all. It's 2 o'clock. I'm going to finish this Bible study. And then I'm going to go outside and collect some more eggs, and I'm going to pray for God to show me each little spot in my life where I am allowing just a little bit of my opinion to take over where he's told me something. 
and I need you to pray for me. I really need you to pray for me. I don't want to compromise anything. I want to be the best daughter he has. And boy, I have failed so much in my life, but I want to be the best daughter he has. Not so that I can beat you, but so that I can bring joy to his heart. I love you all so much. And I'm praying for each and every one of you. God bless you.